on my Leonard Washington. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd. And I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter, as always, at redrock underscore b-ball. Today, we're doing another team preview podcast, looking at the Memphis Grizzlies. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it, indeed. To preview the Memphis Grizzlies and their season coming up, I have the host of the Locked On Grizzlies podcast with me, Mark King, is here. Mark, welcome to the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. All right, so this Grizzlies team, obviously really interesting, a big change from what we've seen in the past. No more, no more Marc Gasol, no more Mike Conley, a younger team, a young core that looks uh, quite vibrant, and uh, I'm pretty interested to see how a lot of these guys go with this squad. So let's start by uh, just updating us on a couple of injuries that occurred last year. Kyle Anderson had a thoracic outlet issue with his shoulder that cost him the end of last season. Where are we at with his recovery? Is he going to be ready to go to begin this season? Yeah, from what I understand, uh, he had that surgery um, about a week after his exit interview last year. Um, everything went really well. It was a, it was a successful surgery. Like I mentioned, it's kind of a weird surgery. It's not a, a very normal thing. It actually happens more in baseball than it does in basketball. Is to remove some some um, the bone and cartilage that had built up and part of his uh, rib cage, which is causing shoulder pain. So, uh, but it did go successfully, as far as I know, and as, uh, as far as we talked to the team. Um, he should be ready to go for opening night. He played 30 minutes a night last season, didn't crack the top 100 in fantasy ranks, mainly because his three-point shooting fell off significantly under 27% from three. He also found it tough going at the beginning of the season to find a rotation role with weirdly Chandler Parsons starting above him. But I don't know where Anderson's going to fit this season on this Grizzlies team. Jay Crowder's been brought in. We're likely going to see more minutes from Jaron Jackson Jr. Is Anderson, do you think, going to be a bench player this season? You know, it, it's an interesting uh, conversation. It's definitely something that one's being had here in Memphis, Jay Crowder versus Kyle Anderson. I, I do probably tend towards thinking that Kyle Anderson will come off the bench and Jay Crowder will start the season. But also think it's a very serious, very serious scenario where Jay Crowder gets dealt in the middle of the year. Maybe you, you look to deal him to a playoff pretending team, who's someone he can help. And then it puts Kyle Anderson right back in the starting lineup. So I think probably in the first part of the year, uh, at least for his purposes, he'll probably come off the bench. Uh, is a very a guy is a guy that does a lot of, a lot of things uh, doesn't doesn't do a lot of things to show up in fantasy but does a lot of things that help the team in different ways uh, but yeah it probably I would assume for the first part of the season come off the bench maybe that changes in the middle to later part of the season there. He actually can be quite a useful fantasy player because he's got a good block rate. He gets steals at a really high rate as well, and he gets assists. Things that tend to go unnoticed at times, but they do uh, accumulate. And he can be a top 100 guy if he gets 30-plus minutes. I just think getting to those 30 minutes might be a bit tough for Anderson. And to me, he's more just a guy that we're going to leave on the waiver wire and then see where it goes and see if he does force himself into a larger role. But his game, I guess the positive is it's not predicated on high usage. He's a very low usage player. It's just about getting those minutes and being able to hit those shots, which uh, hopefully can enable him to put uh, put together those defensive numbers and those assist numbers, which really make you know, all the difference when it comes to his overall fantasy value. So Kyle Anderson, more just a guy at this point to, to leave alone. Another injury last season, Dylan Brooks missed most of the year with a toe issue. Uh, is he ready to go? And is he the likely starting shooting guard? Uh, yeah, everything that I've been, that if we talk to the team, that Dylan is ready to go. Uh, you know, he actually had a combination of injuries last year. The toe ended up being the, the biggest thing. But, you know, he started off the year. It was a, it was a combination of things. He, he would struggle with last year. And so um, it, it, it was a very, very bad year for, for Dylan. Didn't play uh, really at all. And so, you know, this year will be, it'll be really a second in the league this will be a year where you have an expanded role with this team. Uh, we'll definitely look to see if he can uh, really start to hit the you know outside shot a little bit more. In his first year, he started the year off not so great shooting threes, ended up as a much better three-point shooter at the end of the year. So hopefully he can continue that trend in his in his third year. And I think the Grizzlies are going to look to him to be able to do that 
Uh, as of right now, yeah, he is the starting two guard on this team. Um, I think long term is is role is probably not a starting guard in the NBA. I think it's probably a role player off the bench. But this will be his year, which is a lot of the players of the Grizzlies. This will be their year to kind of show what they have and, and prove that they belong in the league, prove they belong on this team. A lot of a lot of projects on this team, and Dylan Brooks is is, is just one of those guys that have to see what he have to see what you have in this player this year. I, I also think that he will be the starting shooting guard. I don't think he's going to be much of a fantasy option. At the end of his rookie season, he had a real opportunity, but that was with yeah, lots of guys out. Mike Conley was out. Uh, Marc Gasol was out at that time, and he just took on a large load, took basically every shot possible, and racked up some big scoring nights. He's not going to be in that situation this season. He's not going to have that opportunity. So to me, he's just a deeper league guy. Maybe he cracks the top 200, maybe, but that's really about it because he's a, a low assist, low steals, low three-volume guy, below average efficiency type of player, which doesn't always translate translate or doesn't really ever translate well into the fantasy realms of things. Let's talk about the the, the bigger end of things, the the uh, the, the better end of, of, uh, of this Grizzlies roster at this point. Let's start with the number two overall pick, Ja Morant. Coming across out of Murray State, is he handed the keys immediately? Yeah, I think so. He'll probably be your opening night point guard starting for sure. Um, you know, there, there are not a whole lot of other options on the team for point guard. You have Tyus Jones, who is going to be a backup. Uh, you have DeAnthony Dalton, who is, again, a project. Um, but I think, yes, Ja Moran is going to be given the keys right away to see. Uh, again, it's, it's going to be the same thing I say over and over here, but it's just, you, know, you want to see what you have in Ja Moran. You know, really, no one really knows. Uh, you don't really know what you're going to get with draft picks. Sometimes they're fantastic, sometimes they're not. And so you just don't really ever know if he's going to be a Chris Dunn or a Chris Paul. And so this is up for debate. No for debate. Uh, he has all the tools and the upside to be an all-star type of player, but you just really never know. But yeah, he'll be given he'll be given every opportunity to prove that though. The thing that I've mentioned with um Moran before is that because of the presence of Tyus Jones, and not that Jones is going to start over them, but if there are some struggles with Morant, Morant, instead of 34 minutes, maybe it's 31 minutes, maybe it's 30 minutes, as Jones can come in and really help settle the team down and help with his development as well. And that puts a, a bit of a worry to me in terms of what his value is. And people always look at, oh, yeah, he's this you know, can't-miss pro, uh, prospect. Uh, people you know, dubbing him point god already. But look at back at you know, top picks in the last couple of drafts, Lonzo Ball and Markel Fultz. Do you feel the same way about them as the number one and number two picks just two, three years ago? That it doesn't always work out. Now, I think Morant still can have a top 100 season this season. I think that the fact that he's ranked 46 on ESPN is ridiculous, though. He should be in the 70s and 80s, and I think his first month or two especially will be outside the top 100 because the shooting is a big concern with him. Can he actually hit these shots? That's going to be the worry, and that's the biggest concern with him entering this season, I think. You know, I think the one thing you, you, and you alluded to, and it's very, very, makes a really good point also, is that point guards are notoriously difficult to just come in and be good right away as a point guard. Yep. Uh, you look at Steph Curry, look at Mike Conley. These guys, it takes a, it usually takes a, a few years, three or four years to really point guards to really get into a groove and be very, very good. Even all-star caliber guards to be very, very good at, at the NBA level is a very difficult position to come in and just be good immediately. And so that's that's also the same thing with John Moran. You know, people, I tell Grizzlies fans all the, all the time, I love John Moran. I think he's going to be good. But also, temper your expectations for the rookie because it's a difficult transition coming from a league like he played in at Murray, at Murray State to the NBA. It's, it's a very, very different league. Yeah, it, it is going to be hard, but his assists are going to be valuable. He can get some steals. He can hit some threes. It's just the percentages. You're really going to have to worry with those as we head into his rookie season. And don't be surprised if he is, again, outside the top 100, top 150 for the first two or three months of the season. Let's talk about uh, a guy that came across in the middle of last season, Mark Jonas Valanciunas. He uh, was re-signed in the offseason after declining his player option. He projects to me to come back in and be the starting center. He had a really strong stretch uh, at the end of the year last year. He played 30 minutes a night. He's never been a 30-minute-a-night guy in his career. I do think that he'll push up in those high 20s this season and uh, be a real focal point for this team offensively and yeah, put up probably the best season of his career will be my guess. Yeah, I think Jonas Valanciunas will definitely be the center option. I would, I would probably be temper the expectations with, with Jonas Valanciunas. You know, he came in at the, the end of the year last year. There there was no Dylan Brooks. There was no Kyle Anderson. There was no Jaron Jackson. Um, there was no John Morant. Uh, none of those guys were there last year. Um, he was basically taking all the shots. It was a lot, like you mentioned, a little till Dylan Brooks a couple years ago. He was taking almost every shot. That's why he was, you know, doing 20 points a night, 10 rebounds a night. So, um, you know, there are going to be 
other there are going to be opportunities for Jonas Valanciunas to be a you know, be an offensive threat for the Grizzlies, but it won't be at the workload that they had him before for sure. Just because of simple math, you're going to put a lot of those shots in Jaron Jackson's hands. Uh, Kyle Anderson, well, if he doesn't shoot a lot, he will shoot some. Dylan Brooks will make plays. Jay Crowder will, will, will take shots. So uh, it, it is really just simple math once you put a lot of those players back into the mix that those shot attempts and those those 20 and 10 nights uh, for Jonas Valanciunas will come down. I think he's more like a 15 and, and 7 guy, maybe a little, you know, something around there. So I think um, I think while he'll be an offensive threat for the Grizzlies at some points, but I think the main focus will be Jaron Jackson Jr. He had a usage exceeding 30% with the Grizzlies last season, and I don't think there's any way that that's going to be able to stick at that level with those other guys around. That is important to note, but I still think he's pretty strong, and he is a good value option. Uh, ranked uh, ADP on ESPN at 89, and Yahoo at 62, Fantrax 79 there as well. I think he can exceed that pretty comfortably, because even if he doesn't have that same usage, the fact that he rebounds the ball well, he's very efficient from the field and from the line, and he's still going to score his points. He's not. He scored 15 points a game last year in just 22 minutes a night, so so he's still got that ability to to score, even if those minutes and that and that usage isn't quite at the same level where it was uh, to end last season. You've mentioned Jaron Jackson Jr. Um, he he had a pretty successful rookie season. Had some moments with foul trouble with JB Bickerstaff not trusting him to play through that foul trouble. We don't really know how Taylor Jenkins is going to handle that now as the new coach of the Grizzlies, but I would imagine as a second-year player, Jackson will be able to hopefully stay out of foul trouble a little bit more and push those minutes up. But what else can you see him being able to improve upon this season? Yeah, they're all in on Jaron Jackson Jr. I mean, he, he's the face of the franchise for sure now. Uh, but Jaron, uh, you know, hopefully something that he, he does really, really well, you know, he, drives, he, he faces up really well and drives the basket really well. Uh, I think his numbers will go up. Uh, I, I hopefully he improves on his rebounding. That's something that he really, really struggled with last year. Um, it's something that the team struggled with last year because Mark Gasol was not a great rebounder and neither was Jaron. So hopefully that's something that he'll improve upon. I think that's something that, that he has to improve upon to be a really, really good player in this league. He's got it. You know, those rebounds have got to go up. But something also that is, I think, is an underrated skill with Jaron is he's a really good passer. Um, he's a really, really smart player. Uh, passes well outside the post, outside to outside the post, passes well inside the post. I think those assist numbers are something you could probably keep an eye on because he is an underrated passer. He's a very very smart player. Um, that's something I think you probably look to this year to maybe improve a little bit more. Jackson uh, was a top 100 player last season in his rookie year, despite those limited minutes. He also probably didn't block as many shots as we would have hoped he, he blocked. I still think that can go up. He's efficient from the line. He's a, a good shooter from the field. Um, he can have big offensive explosions. I do also think that we're going to see a big increase in his usage this season, and it's really going to come down to that those rebounding numbers. Now, he is ranked pretty aggressively on Yahoo. I think it's about right, though. He's on 45 there. I think he's a top 50-ish type of player, really with the potential to be a top 25 guy either this year or next year if everything comes together with those blocks with the threes and if that rebounding comes up and the efficiency continues to improve there can be some big numbers coming for Jaron Jackson Jr. But it's good that you say that he is that face of the franchise. And those uh, 26 minutes a night he played last season are almost uh, guaranteed to increase pretty significantly this season. That's, uh, that's how I see uh, things going for Jaron Jackson Jr. What about the other rookie that they... Um, that they drafted in the first round, Brandon Clark, who was the Summer League MVP, one of the most highly decorated in terms of advanced numbers coming out of college ever, one of the best seasons of all time there, translated that through to Summer League where he dominated again. He is a little bit of an older prospect, about to turn 23 in a month or two. But do you see him immediately coming in and being in a rotation role with this Grizzlies team? You know, it's it's really hard to get a get a gauge on that just because there are so many new people. Uh, obviously, Taylor Jenkins, I don't really know what he's going to do. There's really, it's all it's all up in the air. But I, if I had to guess, if I had to pick something, I would think he'd be in in the rotation off the bench as, as you know maybe the fourth big, third or fourth big. Um, you know, something that if, if he can if he can do something he showed a little bit in summer league, if he can shoot the three ball well, you know, just good enough to be a threat, I think you can put him on the floor in different situations a little bit more, trust him a little bit more. So, you know, it all goes back to that. It'll be one of those things where the Grizzlies, they're just going to have to roll him out there and see what they have in uh, Brennan Clark. So I think you'll see him get minutes, although I don't know if it'll be consistent minutes because some might not see, they, they might, you know, play him. Some nights there might be more minutes of Jaron or Jonah Jonas. I mean, this year for the Grizzlies, it will all, it will be all about figuring out what they have in all of their players, you know, someone, Grayson Allen, Josh Jackson, all those guys have, have options this year. So, you know, those 
fringe guys, rotation guys, you know, they might get minutes, but I don't know how consistent the minutes will be. Clark is a guy that if he gets 25 minutes a night, he's definitely going to be a fantasy option. But yeah, getting to that level is pretty tough. Um, the good thing is that the you know, backup power forward, it's Bruno Caboclo there, who did play well at the end of last season. But I do think that Clark is a significantly better prospect, even if they're only a year apart in age. Caboclo just one year older, despite having been around for about four or five years already. His ability to block shots and be efficient and get steals and be a, a really strong rebounder and efficient scorer is really great for Clark. And I, everyone would know this. You know, I thought he should have been taken significantly higher. I would have had him at number four in my dynasty rookie ranks as well. So uh, there is value there just getting those minutes. I don't think he's a standard league guy uh, for this coming season. Jay Crowder, we touched on him already um, as, as the starting uh, starting small forward most likely. I don't really see him as a great fantasy option though. He struggled with his shot the last few years. He doesn't generate steals at a very high rate, but he should be getting a, a decent amount of minutes and, and being that option there who, who can help on the wing. Or do you see much different from Crowder versus what his role was in Utah? No, I, I think his role will be very similar to what you just said. I think his role will be very very similar to what he was doing in Utah. And like I mentioned earlier, I don't, you know, I don't think they have long term plans for having Jay Crowd on the roster. And so um, I think this front office has shown that they are going to be proactive. They are going to be aggressive and looking for deals to improve this team. And so I think they'll probably continue to do that. And that will probably start with Jay Crowder, who is an asset, and 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 hopefully they'll probably maybe try to move him for additional assets uh, in the future. So, you know, I, I think he'll definitely be on the team, but I think you look, you know, you look up in January or February and there is a, a, a playoff team out there that they can side. They, they might, he might be able to help them in some way off the bench. Uh, then maybe they do that. So um, I think that for, for the short term though, yeah, he'll be, he'll be the starting three and he'll probably have the same, you know, a lot of the same role that he had in Utah for sure. The um, the other guy that came across from Utah is Grayson Allen. You touched on him already. Do you think that he's going to have any sort of rotation role in this team? You know, I, I don't know how big it will be right away. I think they will have to give him some minutes at some point to just um, see if his option's worth it. Um, obviously, he has had some problems. He had problems in summer league. He got tossed out of summer league, which is frankly difficult to do. So there are definitely issues with Grayson Allen for sure. Um, but there's really, there's no, you know, there's no real significant uh, uh, game tape on Grayson Allen if he's a, if he is an actual NBA player or not. So I think they're going to have to give him minutes, and it, I just don't know what clip, and I don't know if there'll be, you know, I don't think there'll be any consistent minutes at all. It'll probably be some nights here and there just to get him some rotation and kind of uh, ease him into things, kind of see what you have, see if you want to pick up his option, those type of things, fringe role player type of things. Let's uh, let's go through a, a guy who is going to have a more significant role, and that is Tyus Jones, who was just brought across from the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves. Uh, the, the imagination, or, or what I imagine is going to happen, is he is the backup point guard behind Moran. But as I mentioned, he's very solid. He's very dependable. He knows how to run an offense. He can defend. His shooting did dip quite significantly last year. But do you see him playing alongside Morant at all? You know, I, it is it is a topic of debate here in the city, but I don't at this point. I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that that will be a huge thing they can do right away. I think it will really depend on what what John Morant will be able to do offensively. Um, you know, Tyus Jones is a guy who is not he's not a shooter. Um, he's not going to go out and, and shoot the ball and get you a ton of points. That's just not who he is. He is a game manager. He is a high IQ guy. He is a high assist guy. You know, Tyus Jones depends. For him to be good, he depends on everybody else around him to be good. And so I think that will really depend more on John Morant if he can be able to be the offensive weapon that they need him to be. If he can make shots on the outside, something that he did struggle with uh, sometimes in college, if he can make a consistent outside shot, if he can get to the basket, how well his offense uh, comes along I think is the, is the key there because John Morant is also known as a passer and can really uh, get the ball in certain spots. And so – if you have two guards out there that both really aren't effectively going to score the ball for you and are just trying to look to set other people up, I don't think that's, that will work. And so I think it really depends on what John Morant's offense looks like uh, further along. They said right away they'll probably try it, but I'm not sure if it will work because I think it will be more of a situation like you mentioned earlier, Tyus Jones really stepping in to help out John Morant because there will be stretches where John Morant is just bad. There will be games where he is not playing well at all, and they can look to someone like Tyus Jones to really come in manage the game, set people up, get people in the right places, 
get the right offense going in the right spot. So that will probably be the most likely scenario that I see that Tyus will be the backup. And if you look up in, in the spring and, and John Morant's come along quite well, then maybe you can put those two together. The, uh, the other guy who I think, or the other interesting situation is the trade that the Grizzlies made, getting DeAnthony Melton and Josh Jackson. I think one of the things that needs to be highlighted, and I've seen it repeated multiple times, is that the trade was for Melton and Jackson was a was a throw-in in that deal, which is yeah, pretty wild considering he was the number four overall pick just a couple of years ago. Just another reason to remember that being a top pick doesn't guarantee you'll be great or even good or even passable because Jackson has really struggled. Uh, let's talk Melton a little bit here first. Uh, I really liked what he did in Phoenix as a, an elite defender defensive point guard but you know what was the idea behind Memphis wanting to get him when they did just sign Jones and did just draft Morant well the other Melton is a player that the front office this front office wanted all along is they drafted Javon Carter in that same draft uh the Anthony Melton I believe that took a little bit earlier than Javon Carter and so uh he is a guy that they really wanted all along they just couldn't have him and so you get to a point like you mentioned was a, also just a fantastic trade for the Grizzlies somehow they got two second round picks uh, and gave away two guys they didn't even want. And they got a project in DeAnthony Milton, a uh, possible project in Josh Jackson kind of remains to be seen there. But um, I like DeAnthony Milton. I think, I think he's got some potential there. You know, it goes back to what I said earlier about Grayson Allen. It's just, or some of these other guys, you just really don't know. And that's kind of the theme of the Grizzlies this year. There's just a lot of guys you just don't know about. There's a lot of guys that have no experience, a lot of young players, a lot of guys that maybe looking for some, um, like maybe like Josh Jackson looking to revive his career. So there's just a lot of unknowns. And I think Anthony Milton has potential. And I think he'll probably spend a lot of time with the hustle, which is the G League team here in Memphis. But I also think he gets some time with the main club to see what he can do. Let's talk about another trade that did go. I, I don't want to talk about Josh Jackson too much because uh, it's just it's frustrating when I talk about him. Just how how bad he has been. <laughs> I, I don't see. I actually let, let's okay. let's talk about him quickly. Is there any role for him on this team? Look, it's going to be the same thing as Grayson Allen. It's going to be fringe role, you know, eight, nine, ten men. Um, maybe you throw him in, a, in some situations to see see what you kind of have. He's got also not an option this year, so I think they'll probably have to play him in some spots just to, just again, to make decisions financially for the future of the franchise. Beyond that, I don't think it makes an impact on the team. The trade I did want to talk about now is Andre Iguodala coming across from the Golden State Warriors at the beginning of free agency. Now, Mark. I don't expect him to play a single second in a Grizzlies jersey. Do you hold that same view? I don't think he'll ever come to Memphis. I'd be shocked if he's here at media days. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't think he'll ever be here. Yeah, so look, when I've done the projections over at Basketball Monster, I haven't included him on the Grizzlies roster because I just don't think that it, there's no point me coming in and projecting 26 minutes a night for Iguodala and taking minutes from Anderson and from Crowder and from all these other guys when he's not going to be there and he's not going to play a, a second with this Grizzlies team. But in saying that with Iguodala, like, what's what's the latest? Have we heard anything about buyouts or other trades being happening or are they just happy just to sort of go slowly with it? Yeah, we, you know, I haven't really heard anything at all uh, on Iguodala. There's no real update, um, even from some just some inside, you know, team people that uh, usually give me some information. Not, nothing really is happening with, with Andre Iguodala at all. He's uh, has never been to the city. Is still probably, I think he's in L.A. still. I'm not sure, but he's never been here. Um, I think they're content to wait it out. Uh, I think they're probably content to just – see what happens uh, when the season starts, uh, just to have him on the roster. Um, you know, the other thing about Iguodala that, you know, you have to look at is financially, it's $17 million you have to move. And so it's 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 not like if, if they wanted to move him in a situation, it's not like they could just move him to any team. There's not a whole lot of teams that have that type of cap flexibility now that all the, the offseason moves have been done. And so there are really only a few teams – they were able to really even move Iguodala into that space, even if they wanted to. And so once you narrow down those teams, it, then you have to talk about, well, who, who is actually interested in Iguodala? Who would he fit on? Who would he help, uh, you know, be in the playoff race? And so once you start doing all that, you really come down to only three, four, maybe five teams that he would even potentially fit on. Um, ultimately, I think they probably buy him out. Um, and I don't think it's a big deal if they do. Uh, a lot of Grizzlies fans don't seem to like that idea. But, again, the Grizzlies already won this deal when they got a first-round pick from the yep. Warriors. A great first-round pick, I might add. It'd be very bad. And so, uh, and probably the most likely scenario is that buy them out. Uh, probably in the fall sometime once the season has started, once they 
realize that the deals are probably not out there to be had. What can you tell us about Marco Goduric, who came across uh, from Europe, played in Turkey last season? Not many people would be well aware of uh, Goduric as a, as a shooting guard who shot a blistering, I think, like 45% from three in Europe last season. There is obviously a spot there at the two guard. Dylan Brooks is hardly a guarantee to be, you know, this big minute sort of a guy. Yeah, you know, behind him, Josh Jackson, DeAnthony Melton, Grayson Allen, all these guys sort of battling for those minutes. With Gudurik's shooting ability, could he force his way into some sort of role? Because this is a team that, that does need some shooting. Yeah, I mean, he can absolutely absolutely do that. He's uh, he's on a two year deal, and so the biannual uh, exception for the Grizzlies, so. He's a little over uh, $3 million uh, that he signed this year. So, you know, he, he's a relatively unknown. And, you know, he, he, I know the biggest questions with him are his defensive liability, uh, if he has the foot speed to really stay with the uh, offensive players in this league. And so that will be the ultimate test for uh, Goderich if he can be, you know, liable on defensive uh, plays for the Grizzlies. I think if you continue the, the, the shooting, if you can, you know, put him in certain spots, you know, that, that the shooting form is – it's something that stays the same usually through most levels. And so I think you, you, you know, you get that and maybe that, that does something for you. And, and he can, if he can play well defensively, then maybe you have something there. But like you mentioned, there's just, there's a lot of guys, uh, a lot of, a lot of projects, a lot of things they have to look at. And so I think they'll be looking at all those things. I don't think there's any clear concrete way that he gets to start, you know, he gets to have solid minutes other than if he just really impresses coaches in practice in the preseason. So um, I think he's a guy that's got potential, it's got, you know, just like every other player I've mentioned on the team feels like, I feel like I say the same thing over and over, but it, it's just the way this team is set up this year, there's a lot of unknowns and, and he's one of them. And hopefully they really need the shooting because they really don't have it. He's got, he would be the most likely candidate to be just a flat out straight up shooter. Um, and I hope that he is, is able to do that because they have been looking for a, just a shooter for, for so many years and they haven't been able to find one, and maybe that's the guy. Hopefully, they strike, you know, can strike gold and, and with Gadish and and really keep him around for, you know, a long time. Because I mean, that's a year deal, but maybe that that's a longer deal. It turns out, who knows? Bruno Caboclo put up some big numbers at the end of last season. He's going to be likely forced into a smaller role this season because Jackson's there, Anderson's there. Both those guys were out last season. Crowder's in the mix now as well. Um, do you think Bruno is like an every night part of the rotation after what he showed at the end of last season? I think he starts out that way. I think he definitely starts out in the rotation for sure. Uh, just because he, he has proven that he's, you know, not, you know, proven in a, in a sense with the Grizzlies that he's, that he's able to do some things that they like. Um, and I know this coaching staff likes Bruno. So I think he'll definitely start out in the rotation, but it also means that, you know, he had a lot of downs last year too. Um, he, he, he ended on a great note. It seemed like he put some things together at the end of the year and, I have high hopes for Bruno Cabello Club because I think he can put those things together uh, next year and, and moving forward. But like you mentioned earlier, he, he's been in the league for a while and still hasn't done it. So uh, there could be some regression to the mean there with Bruno. And if, and if that happens, then there, he has every chance to fall out of a lineup and, and really just move to the end of the bench. But I think starting off, he'll, he'll be solid there in, in the lineup for sure. Okay, and that'll just about wrap up all of these players that we need to talk about here. With the Grizzlies, just uh, before we go, my value pick on this team is Valanchunas at 58. I think he can beat that number. And my bust is Ja Morant on uh, ESPN at number 46. I would not want to take a rookie point guard that high, again, given how poorly I think that he, he will struggle, at least for that initial part of the season. And I think he'll come, come on strong, and maybe he can be a top 60 guy at the end of the year, top 50 perhaps. But wasting a top 50 pick there is uh, exactly that. It's a waste. Mark, thank you for jumping on and talking about this Grizzlies team. Where can people find you on Twitter? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at King underscore producer. Make sure you check out Locked On Grizzlies for all the latest. And yeah, I appreciate you having me. It's always, always fun when I get a chance to talk with you, Josh. Great to have you on, Mark. Make sure you're checking him out there over on Twitter and on the Locked On Grizzlies podcast. Thanks for jumping on with me. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. And that'll do it for today's show, guys. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and on YouTube. Give it a a subscribe. Give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below on this video as well. Follow me on Twitter at redrock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at LockedOnFantasyBasketball. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.
Andre Iguodala.